It's time to be found giving God all you got. You got to worship him with every fiber of your being. And if you can't do that comfortably at your church, it's time to move. If worshiping God, if praising God is taboo, it's time to move. Because worshiping God is always in order. Trust me with your, with your forgiveness. Yeah, yeah. Call his name. Jesus. Just call his name. Jesus. Just call his name. Jesus. And he will run to you. There's nothing like the name of Jesus. There's power in that name. We don't have a religion. We don't have a form or we don't have a fashion. We just worship Jesus. We just obey his word. We follow hard after him. And in return, he lets us have the power that's in his name. Hallelujah. That's why when you whisper his name, it makes you feel better. Instead of worrying about all the things that's going on in your head and overthinking and allowing depression to take over you and allowing anxiety to take over you, all you got to do is just whisper his name. Just whisper his name. Just whisper his name. In Colossians chapter 2, verse 8, the Bible says, Beware lest any man or any woman spoil you. How can they spoil you? Through philosophy and vain deceit after the traditions of men. That's how people can spoil you through all these new philosophies that's coming out. And through the traditions of men, not of God, after the rudiments of the world, worldliness, and not after Christ. That's how you can be spoiled. You were born into this labyrinth called life. Normal human nature, normal human nature proves one of the most difficult things to do is to unplug from the matrix. Dare I ask, what is the matrix? Dare I attempt to teach what the matrix is? Paul said in Romans, there are things that we're dealing with today that will not matter when a certain revealing happens. When a revelation comes, the things that we're dealing with today won't even matter. What is he talking about? Is he talking about something that, that's going to happen that hasn't happened yet that we don't know about? Who doesn't know money ain't real? It's not connected to anything. Certainly not connected to gold like it's supposed to be, like it used to be. That's why Psalms, it says, it's better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. What color egg does a brown bunny lay? You'll be surprised how many people don't know bunnies don't lay eggs. It would shock you. Why do people think that? Why do people think, where did they get that from? Who told you bats are blind? They're not. But you believe that. Why? From where? Who told you that? Where did you get that from? Is it really cold outside? Or is it just cold to you? Another person can stand right next to you and they won't perceive the same cold. How come another person can say it feels great? How can another person say something feels good and you feel the complete opposite? Are you really sad or mad? Why is it the same thing that makes you mad won't make somebody else mad? Why is the worst thing in your life not really a big deal to anybody else? We feed the power to the matrix daily. How? With visuals, with worldliness, and with programmed and we don't even know it. That's why they call it programming. Why can someone else not handle something that, that you're going through with ease? Why is it something that doesn't bother you can destroy somebody else? And something that destroys somebody else doesn't mean anything to you. If I wanted you to hate bananas, because I hate them, I can show you a picture of just one banana with a bug in it. Then I can show you a video of a person getting sick off of a rotten banana. Then I can send you a TikTok. I can send you a TikTok of somebody saying, you shouldn't eat bananas. <laughs> when you go back to the grocery store, your mind will subconsciously abhor bananas. The world is set up to make you love what you should hate and hate what you should love. Did you know dandelion roots can be used uh, for medicinal purposes? We were taught it's ugly and useless. Pluck it up, get rid of it, throw it out. Who knew?
God is holy. God is all righteous, but God said he created evil. But he created evil with a cause. He created evil with a point. He created evil with a purpose. I God said, said, I form the light and create dark. Catch that? You thought darkness always existed and then light chased it away? No, God said he created darkness. What was before darkness? God said, I make peace and I create evil. This is, this is not some ordinary God that we're serving here. Pain is designed to do what? To make you move. It's not totally a bad thing. Pain is that sign that says, go south. Pain is, is, is also some, sometimes the best teacher sent by God. Some people won't go to the doctor until that pain hit them right in the right spot, the right amount of pain. Then you'll find out. The doctor will then say, if you hadn't came in when you came in, if you would have came in one week later, Thank God for pain, because there's some pains in your life that's not there to destroy you. The pain didn't catch God off guard. It's a blessing. Sometimes you're going through things and it's overwhelming you, but you have to look at the greater good, the an end game. What is the purpose that God has for me? There are some pains in my life, in my life, that came attached to an anchor in my soul that says never again. I needed that pain to get there. I don't know about you, but there are some things that I will never do again. And it's specifically because of the pain. So don't despise pain. Do something about it. You don't have to despise pain because pain probably came at the exact time, the exact moment to cause you to move, to cause you to do something. King Jimmy, King James, he authorized 80 books. What's in those 14 books that they removed? What's the real reason people say you don't have to keep the commandments? You don't have to keep the law anymore. What's the real reason they don't like saying or reading or reciting or reading the scripture out loud that says Jesus' feet is black? Why do your pastor and any preacher, why do they avoid altogether the book of Obadiah? Why is it necessary to have an all-inclusive salvation? Why is God always only grace and mercy and love for everybody? And never wrath, never vengeance, never destruction. People don't know the real God of the Bible, do they? Why do they teach you to be docile? They don't want you to know that you have enemies. Why don't they want you to know who Cain is, who Esau is? Or who the people are that killed Jesus? Why? Why do we keep these, these things a secret? Why is these things hidden? Why do we not like to talk about this stuff? Nobody likes major change. Nobody likes major change. Nobody likes big change. And nobody likes major change often. Especially when change forces you into the unknown. That's why you see somebody working at a job that they can't stand. Because a change in the wrong direction could be catastrophic. It could mess them up. They do the wrong thing. You'll see somebody, you'll see somebody even abusing themselves with drugs or nicotine, alcohol, because change is painful. I've, I've seen people try to stop smoking and they go back to smoking because it's too painful. I've seen people try to stop drinking coffee, but they get the headaches. It's, it's too painful. I, I can stop drinking. I could. Because it, it would allow a drinking and smoking. I could stop that because drinking, and, if I stop drinking and if I stop smoking, my liver would appreciate it. My lungs would clear up. But it's too painful. The challenge is accepting major change. Once you accept it, you can go through with it. But the challenge is accepting that I got to make a change. That's why you won't leave the guy that's going upside your head. That's why you won't leave the woman that won't come home. Because I can't deal with what might happen next. See, I'm comfortable with what already happened. I can deal with what already happened or what's currently happening. But what's currently happening is based on how well you handle even those situations beyond your control. If you do the wrong thing or if you make the wrong decision, what happened? Are you anxious? Are you worried or upset when it's time to make a move, a new move? Or are your steps ordered by the Lord? Are you worried about what's going to happen tomorrow? Or are you confident that God got me? Are you in a position with your Savior 
that you can say, I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow, but I know who's in control of tomorrow. Whatever plans God got, I know that I'm included in it because I have been spending some time with the Lord. Give direction for your life. But where? How? How valuable is that direction? I don't want to drive five miles north when I'm supposed to be there. Nor do I want to be driven by somebody driving five miles north when I'm supposed to be going south. How precious. What are you willing to give from specific directions from the Lord? How important is that? How precious is that? That's why your circle is important. Thank you. That's why choosing the right friends is paramount. Because friends can hinder you. Yes, they can. The person you marry can destroy you. The church you go to. God help me today. God is meeting you at the crossroad today. You began this labyrinth called life when you were born. You're almost halfway through it. But you're stuck and you don't realize it. Your rhema word from the Lord today is do something. The scripture says, I can call, I call heaven and earth to record this day against you. That I have set before you life and death, says Moses. Blessings and cursings. He's even telling you how to choose. He says, therefore, choose life. Choose a good life. Choose a holy life. Choose a sacrificial life. Watch this so that both you and your kids may live. But what do my kids have to do with my choices? My choices are that important? God's message for you today is simple. It's time to do something. God is saying, move something. It's time to change something. Don't focus on the pain. Do something. Separate from something. Sever something. Destroy something. Eliminate something. You already know what it is. You already know God has already been talking to you. You've already been praying about something. And God is saying it's time to move. This is how it works. When you pray fervently, effectually, okay, I'm talking about those kind of prayers. When you pray like that in the spirit, God sends a man of God with your mail. Listen to the Holy Ghost. Okay. You might not get another warning. I have a question. If you're sick, there's medicine and doctors. If you're in an abusive relationship, there's centers and shelters. If your job is stressing you out, there's career change options. Right? But if you hurt from if your pain comes from the church, where, who, what do you do if the pain comes from the church? We have options for every other issue, major issues. But what do you do if your pain comes from the church? Do you know your God? Your God, your Savior. We serve the real God here. And all the church said amen. That's why I ask God for hard things. I ask God for hard things, miraculous things. That's why you got to live a holy life. That's why you got to separate from sin so God can hear you, especially in, in the time of calamity and tribulation. You don't have time to have a long, drawn-out prayer. Sometimes you might just have to whisper his name. So when the man of God can reach your spirit, it's because of your life that you've been living, the time that you've been spending with God, and then God will give that man of God your message. I don't want to talk to your flesh. I want to, I, I want to talk to your spirit. Your spirit knows it's time to move. Your spirit is yearning to be closer to God. So move. Do something about it. When you get your, when you get your life right, when you repent for all your secret sins, when you stop all the things you don't think anybody know about, when you think God didn't see or you think you forgot, when you're done, follow hard after God. Do something different than what you've been doing. Don't do something that you've already done. You've already sang that song. That prayer sounds exactly the same. It's time to do something else. Get past your comfort zone and please stop caring about what people think and what people say. Here's an assignment. I want y'all to do this. I want y'all to ask God for three things quickly. You write it down if you want. Three things that you want. 
you don't want to write it down, think about it in your head. Think three things that will make you happy. If you can't write it down, just think about it. Three things. Get it on your mind. Now imagine how happy you would be if he answered all three right now. Wouldn't it be nice if God did that for you? Okay, now I want you to tell God three things you'll do for him. What's wrong? That's a little harder, right? Why? Just tell God three things that you that, that he wants. Ask what you want is easy. God ain't no genie in a bottle. You got to give God something if you want God to give you something. But you got to give God something first. What are those three things or what are three things that you could change in your life and could give up? What three things could you change in your life? Right now, when I ask you to, to ask God for three things, you asked for a bunch of stuff, didn't you? What, what was the three things you asked for? Don't answer. Was it material stuff? Why didn't you ask for direction? Was that one of the things? Why didn't you ask for the ability to make great decisions? Why didn't you ask to be able to hear his voice clearly? Do you want to go the wrong direction five miles? Do you want to be carried in the wrong direction by somebody else? Why, why is that not the most precious thing? Why do we put so much value on material things? Why didn't you ask? Why wasn't one of those three things you asked for to be able to see his face? Can you imagine if God was going to give you three things? Can you imagine if one of them, what kind of person would it take to say, Lord, I just want to see your face. I just want to see what you look like. Why didn't you ask God? Just come when I call you. How about that? Whenever I call you and just say, come sit next to me, Jesus. Why didn't you just ask for that? Why did you think of three things for yourself? God help us. Why didn't you think of three things that would benefit him, worshiper? Why didn't you think of three things that you can give up so you can be closer to him, to destroy some of your flesh, to allow your spirit to get closer to him? Why don't you do it now then? How about that? Why not please your God? Why not leave this room? Why not leave this YouTube better? Why not ask God for three things or give God three things that benefits him? You young people, you young people are about to enter a stage in your life. Every adult will tell you this is the age and the stage in your life where they made the most mistakes of their life. You should be asking for sound instruction. You should be asking for good leadership. You should be asking for a humble spirit. Why? So you can accept correction, right? That's necessary. So you can accept criticism. You should be asking for the desire to learn life's lessons early so you don't make stupid mistakes throughout your life and then wish your kids would understand and hope that they won't do what you did. What three things did you choose? Which one of y'all chose the Holy Ghost? Which one of y'all chose the Holy Ghost? How many out there chose that you want to be saved? You want to see God's face in peace? All right, I need your help because I'm confused. If you're in an abusive relationship, you'll do what you have to do to stop it or you'll move. You'll move. Great. Excellent idea. For some reason, if, you, if you're being abused by the church, you'll stay? I need to understand that. If your job doesn't provide the opportunity to grow, you'll leave. If they're not paying you enough money, you'll leave. You'll go to school. You'll do whatever you got to do. But if you're not growing spiritually at your church, you'll stay? If your friends need $1,000, no, can't do that right now. If your pastor says, pay $1,000 for an anniversary. If there's so much pain at church, why? I don't, I don't understand. If you're not careful, it will feel good to feel bad. And after so long, it'll feel bad to feel good. When after you've discovered the truth, when after the source of pain of evil have been discovered, why not unplug it? Why not reset? Why not reposition? Why not repurpose? Even if the immediate outcome is unknown, why not? Why stay there? Why not move? Why not do something? You want God to tell, to, to, to speak directly to you and, and, and make the pain go away and make it plain. That's not how God works. You want me or, or, or your pastor or your spiritual leader to say specifically what it is. No, God wants you to plug into him. He's not going to give you everything all, all the time. You know why? Because you'll run off without him. 
He wants you to seek him daily. And if he gives you everything, you won't need him anymore. That's how we humans are. Even the disciples couldn't figure out what. Hey, Jesus, why do you just why don't you just talk straight? They asked him. Why, why do you speak to people in parables? God gives mysteries to your pastor tailored for you. If you think Samson was defeated by Delilah cutting his hair, it's time to move. If you think Noah took two of each animal on the ark, then you better move and seek the truth. It's time to do something else. If you go to bed with another lie, you'll wake up with that same deception. Why do you believe what you believe? How come your religion? Is your religion the same as your mom? Is your religion the same as your great grandma? How come oftentimes your denomination is the same as your slave trader? Check your history. Figure out what plantation you're on and see if your denomination matches master. Go check. Why do you believe what you believe? Because it's easy. It's too difficult to change. Turn to me to Bell and the Dragon, chapter one, King James Version of the Bible. We're going to start with verse two, dedicating this to you. This is a continuation of the book of Daniel. This, this actually would have been chapter 14 of the book of Daniel. This is after Daniel escapes the lion den. The scripture says, and Daniel conversed with the king. At this time, this would have been King Cyrus of Persia. Daniel was honored above all his friends. Verse three, now the Babylonians had an idol called Bel, and they gave him every day 12 huge amounts of flour, 40 sheep, six vessels of wine. And the king worshiped Bel and went every day, not just on Sunday, to adore this idol. But Daniel worshiped Yahweh, the only true and living God. Hallelujah. And the king said unto him, hey, Daniel, how come, how come you don't worship Bel? Daniel answered and said, because I don't break the commandments. I'm not permitted to worship idols made with hands, but I will worship the living God who created the heaven and the earth and has sovereignty over all flesh. Verse six, then, the, then said the king unto him, you think, you, you think Bell is, you don't think Bell is not a living God? Don't you see him as that joker eating every day, he eat and drink up everything. You don't think he's living? Why, how do you, how did you deduce that? How did you come up with that? Then Daniel smiled and said, oh, king, don't be stupid. Don't be tricked. For this is but clay and inside is brass. I mean, it's clay on the inside and brass on the outside and never ate or drank anything. Ooh, Daniel, you done did it now. So the king was ticked off, mad. And he called for his priests. And he said, if y'all don't tell me right now who eats all of this stuff every night, I'm gonna kill all of you. But if you can prove to me that Bell ate all of this stuff, then I'm going to kill Daniel. I'm going to kill that joker because he keep talking smack against Bell. So Daniel said to the king, all right, do it. Do exactly that. So these false preachers of Bell, they said to the king, all right, king, listen, we're going to leave. When we go out, oh, king, set up all the meat and make the wine ready and shut the door. But this time, hurry up and seal it and, and put your, your ring on the seal so nobody can go past it, okay? And then tomorrow when you come back, if you don't see that Bell ate up everything, then we'll, it's okay. You can kill us. We'll, we'll suffer death. It's fine. But if not, kill that guy. Kill Daniel because he's been telling lies against us. That's, 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 that's the deal. They wasn't worried because under the table, they made a secret entrance. That's the secret passageway that they use every day to come and eat all the food up. They wasn't worried. Do you think Daniel was worried? What made Daniel so sure this idol wasn't eating the food? These false preachers use something as simple and silly as food to trick multitudes of people for years to believe in their goofy religion. All they had was food. So when they gone out, the king set meats before Baal. At the same time, the devil was setting his trap. Daniel knew his God. Daniel said, all right. Daniel had his own servants. Daniel's a big shot now. And he got his own servants. He said, hey, take these ashes. 
sprinkle them all on the floor. Okay? All over the floor of the church. King, you see what we're doing? The king watched Daniel's service, take the ashes, put it all over the floor. All right. Nobody else was in there. So he left out, shut the door, sealed it. The king put his ring on it. That means nobody can go in there. If you go in there, you're dead. Veil and the Dragon, uh, chapter 1, verse 15. Now in the night came the priests with their wives and children, like they normally do, and they ate and drank all the food and all the wine. And this is how it's going to be for you. While the enemy is rejoicing, God is working in the middle of the night. The Bible didn't say joy comes in the night hour. So hold on a little while longer. God will make a way out of no way. He's going to do it somehow. How? I don't know. But God is a miracle working God. And he can do all things. This looks familiar. In the morning, the king barely woke. First thing on his mind. I, I, I'm surprised he even slept. I would be shocked if he even slept. Because it's been on his mind all night. He comes out. He comes out of the balcony. He calls with Daniel. Hey, Daniel, what, is the seal still up? Daniel said, yep. Is the sanctuary still up? Locked tight. Yep. So they go in from the second floor and they look down in the sanctuary. King didn't even wash his face because he, he want to hurry up and get this. King, he went in and as soon as he opened the door, he looked at the table and he screamed, Great art thou, O Bell. And with thee is no deceit at all. He happy because he proved a lie. He happy that he proved a lie to be a lie. The lie he went to bed with, he woke up still deceived. He happy because he can still believe what he already believed and it won't have to change. He won't have, he won't have to change anything. He happy because he don't have to be wrong. He doesn't want to be wrong. So Daniel start cracking up. Ha! <laughs> See, that's the joy in the morning. He told the king, wait. No. Daniel said, look at the floor. Because all you looked at was the table. And look real good at whose footsteps they are. Notice the king came in and he checked the food. Why didn't he check the ashes? He was there when Daniel put the ashes on the floor. Why did he find comfort in what he already believed? If he checked for the ashes first, then you could say he wanted to prove what he believes. Then you could say he wanted proof. He saw Daniel put the ashes there. But he didn't want to know the truth. Who wants to find out their religion? Who wants to find out their denomination is wrong? That would mean mama's wrong. That would mean the prophet was wrong. That would mean my pastor was wrong. That would mean all my friends at church are deceived. But when faced with the facts, when you see the proof, the king said, oh, snap. I'm sure he said another word, a different word. <laughs> He said, oh, snap, I see footsteps. I see men and women and kids' footsteps. Now the king is mad. I'm so glad Daniel had a plan. I'm so glad he knew his God was with him. I want my actions to make the devil mad. You wanted to kill me, now you're mad. Huh, king, you wanted to kill me? You thought you was going to get a chance to publicly, publicly embarrass me. But I had a plan. Daniel never said anything about all these people worshiping these false religions for years. But he always had an answer to where his hope lies. I know who my God is. Some days things get really rough and I long to hear his voice. Sometimes things get hard and I can't find him, but I'm so glad every now and again he moves down on the inside and say, didn't I promise you that I'll never leave you? Didn't I promise you that I'll never forsake you? I'm going to be with you until I come back. I'm so glad that we have a God that we can have. And their wives and their children. We went and got all of them and said, hey, no cap. Show me how you did this. They scared. They scared. They came back. So they went, they showed them the secret doors. When they came in at, and ate everything that was on the table, and what, what did the king do? He killed all of them. You know what Daniel said? Nothing. Not my problem. The king went, he got the dumb statue, he gave it to Daniel and told him, do whatever you want with it. Daniel not only destroyed it, watch this, he got his construction crew to come mosh up the temple, tear it down. You can use that temple for your God, right? 
No. Because the real God will never dwell in an unclean vessel. That's why you got to repent. That's why you got to worship to wash out your soul. Didn't you use a building for a school or something? No. It all has to go. Every ungodly thing has to be destroyed. Every ungodly thing has to go. Every ungodly thing in your life, you got to kill it. Every secret sin, you got to break it. What about all them folk getting ready to come to church Sunday? They, they come to worship Bell. Where are they going to go? All that folk has been deceived for years, generation after generation. What, what, what are they going to do? What, what are you going to tell them so their heart's not broken when they find out they were wrong? They're about to find out that their belief system was false. How will they handle knowing their, that, that their faith was a lie? Most of these people came just because everybody else did. Most people go to church because it's Sunday. Most people go to that church because their family go to that church. But it's your responsibility to know the truth. It's the only thing that will make you free. You've been doing the same thing over and over and keep getting the same result. It's time to move. You complain about your situation to your coworker every day. Do something about it. You're in a dead end job. Do something about it. The spirit of the Lord isn't moving in that church. Do something about it. Why sit there? Why is that your denomination? Prove it. Show me your denomination in the Bible. Book, chapter, verse, please. Don't go to your pastor. Don't go to your priest. Try the spirit by the spirit and see if it be of God. Because every spirit ain't from God. How come ain't no true worship going on in your church? They say the spirit of the Lord is here. Well, how are you standing? If the spirit of the Lord was truly there, you wouldn't even be able to say that. When was the last time your pastor was slain in the spirit? When was the last time you had to go help get him up off the floor? Because that's what real worship is. Bow down and worship him. Some of us need to start on our belly. Some of us need to really get deep into worship and take some time out. No more church as usual. Don't you notice the final hour? It's time to be found giving God all you got. You got to worship him with every fiber of your being. And if you can't do that comfortably at your church, it's time to move. If worshiping God, if praising God is taboo, it's time to move because worshiping God is always in order. You can't come home. And, and there's a, if you come home and there's a situation that won't allow you to worship your God, then it's time to move. Or move that situation. But, but you got to put God first. You got to let God lead you. You got to let God be your focal point. Whatever you do, do it so God can get some glory out of your life. Why do you go to that church Sunday? And why are you going this Sunday? Why? What's, what's the real reason? You need to get over your past. So do something. You're afraid of dealing with grief because you lost your loved one. Well, do something about it. What will it actually take you to move? It's good that you have a really high pain tolerance. H how much more can you take? We here, we got a whole system here to help you. You need to escape an abusive relationship? We got help for you. Want to try and fix your marriage? We got help for you. Need to change churches and partner with us? Great, we can help you. We can send a letter directly to your pastor for you. We can make the breakup easy. Need to be ushered in the presence of the Lord? We can help you. Need the Holy Ghost? We can help you. Need to learn how to pray? We can help you. God has sent you help. What are those three things that you promise you will do for God? If you haven't done it yet, do that now. I want you to promise God three things right now. Three things that you'll do for God. Three things that you'll give up. Let's pray together so God will move. Let's pray together so, so God will move in your life. And let's pray that you are able to prove what you believe. Don't just do stuff because it's tradition. Don't just do stuff because it's what you've always done. It's time to do something so God can do something. Why do you believe what you believe? Prove it. Why do you do what you do? Prove it with the Bible. I know change is hard. I know. But God said it's time. It's time to move. Make a plan. Do something else. <laughs>